Earlier this year, I read all of this <clears throat> effing thing. <clears throat> More recently, I sat through all 39 episodes of the TV version, and wow, those two stories are not even close to being the same thing. In fact, beyond some superficial similarities, these two stories have about as much as common as any other two random books you can pick off your shelf. I want to be clear about something up front. This is not a video about how an adaptation changing a part of the story it's adapting makes it bad. Change is not an inherently bad thing, and is often necessary to make a story work in a medium it's being adapted into. You don't even have to look beyond Stephen King for an example of this. I'm sure I don't need to tell you about the movie and miniseries versions of The Shining, right? That's been discussed to death. Change is neither good nor bad, it simply is. So this video isn't about noting that these two stories are indeed different. We're going to examine how they're different, dissect the differing storytelling approaches of each version of the story, and discuss how, in trying to carve its own identity, the TV show failed to understand the appeal of the original material whilst also failing to create a matching appeal of its own. The core difference between these two stories is that Under the Dome, the novel, is character-driven, whereas Under the Dome, the TV show, is plot-driven. What do I mean by that? Well, when a story is character-driven as the name implies, the narrative is more about the characters. It isn't just the decisions they make, but how and why they make them. And said decisions usually have ramifications that echo throughout the story. This kind of story will flesh out a character's history and relationships, and the characters are the primary cause of any forward momentum in the narrative. A plot-driven story, however, is less about the characters and more about, well, uh, the plot. The characters are secondary elements there to react to whatever the plot throws at them. It's more about what's happening as opposed to who the things are happening to. For easy examples, you can look at the early and later seasons of Game of Thrones as embodying character versus plot driven narratives respectively. I'm far from the first person to note this, and you can easily look up articles discussing this in greater depth, so I'll keep this brief. The bulk of the first season is spent building up the cast, their personalities and motivations and so on, so that you can follow each character's internal logic behind their every action. Thus, when the season culminates in trash boy declaring that Sean Bean should lose his head, you can trace back every decision that led to this point and understand how we got here, and that one event has ramifications that ripple throughout the rest of the series, informing the motivations of other characters and causing them to take actions that result in whole new story threads that are purely a result of this one event and other characters' reactions to it. In other words, the narrative is shaped by the characters and their actions. But then you've got the later seasons where it's like, uh, I'ma blow up a whole church, an act which should reasonably upset a lot of people and have serious ramifications both for my safety and the peace of my city, but doesn't because the show needs me to go unchallenged until Dragon Lady shows up. In contrast to the earlier seasons, events either will or will not occur as the plot demands it. In other words, the later seasons are plot-driven. To be clear, no story is solely either character or plot driven. This isn't a rigid binary so much as a, a spectrum. Neither version of Under the Dome falls completely on one end, but they do lean pretty hard in opposite directions. How do they do that? Well, let's look at the book first. Under the Dome, the novel is about the residents of Chester's Mill, a small town in, where else, Maine, who one day find themselves unable to leave town when a mysterious barrier suddenly appears that completely cuts off access to the outside world. The book opens just as the dome appears and a plane crashes into it, itself an important event whose ramifications echo all the way to the end of the novel, and spends the next hundred or so pages just exploring the immediate aftermath of the initial event and introducing the novel's metric ass ton of characters as they learn about and try to comprehend just what the hell is going on. We learn about all the important players and some of the not so important ones, their personalities and relationships, and we get a small example of how their interactions with one another will shape the narrative going forward. Most notably, we're introduced to Dale Barbara, aka Barbie, an army vet who was trying to skip town when the dome came down, 
due to his having pissed off the wrong people, namely Big Jim Rennie. Big Jim's a used car salesman and one of the town's three remaining elected officials, and let's just say he's a little power hungry. Barbie's the first to get a grasp on what's happening and asks a dude named Ernie to call the Air National Guard and institute a no-fly zone. Already got one plane crash that killed two people after all, don't want another. Ernie ends up coming to Big Jim when he gets through to the ANG and then Homeland Security, and Big Jim, not liking that Dale Barbara one bit and wanting to be important and in control, hijacks the call, tells Homeland that everything's fine, and hangs up. Granted, once he goes out and sees for himself what's going on, he changes his mind, but he does so by making it his idea to call Homeland Security, just to still be important. That's just a microcosm of how conflicts will form throughout the novel personal character conflicts resulting in bigger problems. Big Jim will put lives in danger to satiate his ego, to grab power, and to butt heads with Barbie. And boy, do lives get put in danger. A letter arrives from the President of the United States putting Barbie in charge, and Big Jim don't like that too much. Whatever scribble dee dee dogs bought him might have written it, the bastard had signed it himself, and using all three of his names, including the terrorist one in the middle. <laughs> So he starts taking steps to seize power, like holding ransom the prescription medicine of Andrea, one of the other elected officials who might have opposed him, putting her out of commission for most of the rest of the book. Later on, he decides to forcibly close both of the town's grocery stores and sends the police, which he's been stuffing with thugs loyal to him, to enforce the closure, but those thugs have been causing problems around town, and pretty soon a riot breaks out with people desperate for food and Big Jim's thug cops violently trying to beat them back. Andy Sanders, the last of the town's elected officials who's actually in Big Jim's pocket, gets to sweep in and take credit for calming things down, even after Barbie and company put in the work to actually do the calming. Andy, by the way, is going a little crazy after losing his wife in that plane crash at the start of the book, and he's about to lose it even harder when he learns that his daughter Dodie was killed. Big Jim's son Junior killed Dodie along with a girl named Angie toward the start of the book, but we can't very well have the son of Big Jim go down for murder, now can we? Big Jim's gotta keep his power, and you know what? That Barbie's been a real thorn in his side, and he's an out-of-towner anyway, so why don't we frame him for those murders? Who's everyone going to believe after all? A stranger or good old Big Jim? but no one realizes how far off the deep end all of this is going to cause Andy to go, and I've been yapping on for a bit, and there's a whole lot I didn't even touch on, but you get the idea. The novel has countless little narrative threads that weave in and out, playing off and affecting one another, and all those threads stem simply from the characters interacting with one another. Story from character. Under the Dome, the TV show, meanwhile, does not do much of that. It's plot-driven, so instead of the characters driving the story forward, the focus is on whatever mystery or random event the writers decided to toss in any given week. The story is formed by characters reacting to things instead of playing off of each other, to the point that they'll act in ways that are either illogical or inconsistent with their characterization just for the sake of following whatever plot the writers have planned. For instance, the romance between Julia Shumway and Barbie was so terribly forced and absolutely should not have lasted, but did because, uh, what, be because they were an item in the book, so they had to be here? Because you have male and female lead on your high-profile network TV show, so they must be an item to satisfy viewers and keep up ratings? Because it's a plot element that Julia must save Barbie from sci-fi brainwashing with the power of love in season three, and that can't happen if she hates his guts, which she absolutely should? This show didn't take into account that the versions of Julia and Barbie it had created were so different from their book counterparts that it makes no sense for them to end up together as they did in the book. The plot demands that they be an item, so be an item they will be. But okay, let me back up. Why doesn't it make sense that these two characters are together? Well, simple, really. Barbie killed Julia's husband. And she's fully aware of this. Dale Barbara murdered Peter Shumway, proceeded to sleep with Julia Shumway, then Julia Shumway learned that Dale Barbara murdered Peter Shumway, and then she gets over it really quickly and hops right back in bed with him. What the fuck? 
even if we're being generous and try to interpret this as Julia embodying the virtue of forgiveness or something, she doesn't spend near enough time grappling with this revelation for us to believe that she had any real hang-ups over it. No matter what narrative justifications they weave in about Peter wanting to die and giving her life insurance or whatever, she just gets over it way too quick for the sake of the plot because it's apparently a necessity that she and Barbie must fuck. So the show's just content to bury her past and ignore the fact that she should have a lot more to say about it. Another good example of prioritizing plot over character can be seen with Junior Rennie, son of Big Jim. He starts off the show by kidnapping Angie McAllister, sister of Joe McAllister, because, given his parentage, he's had a rough upbringing and isn't the most stable person. Later, Angie escapes, and it turns out that she, Junior, Joe, and Joe's girlfriend, Nori, are the, air quotes, four hands. In other words, they are all, for some unexplained reason, the key to activating a plot device whose purpose changes over the three seasons, and the absence of any one of the four hands could screw things up very badly. At least if one of them were absent, the writers wouldn't be able to use the plot device they just set up, so for the sake of the plot, all four hands need to get along or at least cooperate. Problem. Joe finds out that Junior kidnapped Angie. Oops, now Joe's pissed. He doesn't want Junior anywhere near them, nay. He just might want to kill Junior. So now we've got a good conflict set up that resulted from the actions and personalities of the involved parties. A conflict that could have potentially huge ramifications for not just the characters directly involved, but for everyone around them. Because if the four hands aren't together to activate the plot device as a natural result and consequence of those characters' actions, well, that's just some good drama and additional mystery right there. So how does this conflict play out, and how does the show resolve it? Well, uh, it doesn't, and it doesn't. We've got a plot that needs to happen, remember? The four hands need to come together. That's the plot. Plot first, character second. Joe gets to be mad for, like, one scene, and then they carry on cooperating like nothing happened. Like, nothing ever comes of that again rendering the whole conflict between Joe and Junior and Hell, the kidnapping of Angie to begin with, a meaningless waste of time. So how the hell did this happen? How did a narrative about the interpersonal conflicts of a swath of characters all confined together get transformed into a plot-centric one that treats its characters like puppets instead of people? Well, I think I can sum it up quite nicely. Under the Dome, the novel, is about the people trapped under the dome, while Under the Dome, the TV show, is about the dome. The novel understood that its core appeal was not the dome itself. The dome was just a simple plot device for bringing the cast together. It didn't need to do anything other than exist in order for an engaging story to happen. The characters did all the legwork on that front. But the TV show? It's all about the dome, baby. We've got to get the four hands to unlock the mini dome so that we can get the egg and then toss the egg in the lake to make everything go bright. And then the egg revives a dead girl and oh no, the dome's making it cold, but uh oh no, it's not. And actually it turns out there are eight hands and now the dome is shrinking. Oh no, what does the dome want? What does the dome want? What's the dome doing now? What's with the dome? What's with the dome? What's with the dome? As the show goes on, it focuses more and more on the mysteries of the dome. Something weird will happen with it, and the plot is about the characters reacting to it instead of each other. Season 1 is the closest to the novel in terms of narrative structure, where there is a greater focus on story resulting from the actions of the characters, but by the time you get to Season 3, all of that's just gone. Season 3 is about the whole town except for a few main characters being sci-fi brainwashed by aliens, and we've got a fight back against the aliens or maybe work with them to survive the dome and that's just the total opposite of what made the book appealing. Whereas the book was about the characters, season 3 stripped away all character through literal brainwashing in favor of a simple us versus them good guy versus bad guy narrative. So now that we've outlined these stories storytelling approaches, the final thing we must discuss is how the appeal of the original was inescapably tied to its storytelling approach and how the show both didn't grasp that appeal and didn't utilize its own approach to its greatest potential. The appeal of the novel was in its character-centric approach. It painted a vivid portrait of an isolated town and the residents therein. The story was engaging because you got to follow a swath of characters as they went about their business and weaved in and out of each other's lives, and as you followed each character, you got a better understanding of not just them, but the people around them and the very town they lived in. It was a story first and foremost about people, about how they act and treat each other under stress and during crises, along the way touching on themes of authoritarianism, camaraderie, and existentialism, and 
all of that emerges just from characters bouncing off one another. Themes and narrative threads spurred on through the interactions of fleshed out characters. That is what made the novel compelling. And that appeal is not present in the TV adaptation. Like we've discussed, it's about plot instead of character, with mysteries about the dome taking center stage to the detriment of the character work. And that didn't have to be a bad thing. Neither plot nor character-driven storytelling approaches are inherently superior or inferior to one another. They simply are, and it all depends on whether any given story leans into the strengths of its approach or at least balances its elements. Hell, lots of popular and celebrated media are plot-driven and they do their jobs just fine. Just look at bloody Star Wars. A New Hope is mostly driven by characters reacting to external stimuli, and it works not just because it's exciting and follows a logical dramatic progression that climaxes in one of the most iconic scenes in all of cinema, but because it takes just a little little time to do the character work to justify the characters going along with the plot. You've got young Luke Skywalker, bored, listless, longing for adventure, and lo, he hears the coal. And he wants to answer it so bad, but he's a responsible young man. He's got work he needs to do, and he would feel guilty about leaving his family behind. So how do we get Luke to answer the call to adventure? Why, we've got to give him a good reason to leave. And now, with no reason to stay and ample reason to go, Luke can set out on his journey and seize his destiny. All because the movie took a little time to justify his following the plot. It did the character work to justify the narrative. Imagine if Star Wars didn't take the time to do that. Imagine if, after receiving the call to adventure, Luke, despite knowing and being invested in his responsibilities at home, as he's been shown to be, he just decided, eh, fuck it, let's go to space. That'd be just a little off, right? It'd be like his character suddenly changed to accommodate the plot, right? Well, that's the TV version of Under the Dome in a nutshell. Luke running off with Obi-Wan without stopping in to check on his aunt and uncle first. Despite shifting to a plot-centric structure, Under the Dome, the TV show, does not do the necessary character work to justify its cast going along with the beats of its story. Julia just forgets about her murdered husband. Joe just forgets about Junior kidnapping Angie. Danny just kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet. <laughs> and that, dear show, that is why you fail. The final sort of irony I want to note here has to do with the writing approach of Mr. Monarch himself. In his memoir on writing, cleverly titled uh, On Writing, he outlines his general approach to crafting narratives. In short, he likes to drop characters into situations and see what they do. In his words, I want to put a group of characters in some sort of predicament and then watch them work themselves free. My job is to watch what happens and then write it down. And all that tracks with what we've discussed about his version of Under the Dome so far. King's a man who's practiced in his craft and set in his patterns, and the Under the Dome novel very much follows from that philosophy, which is likely why its appeal is so easily identifiable and appreciable. The funny part comes in when King speaks on his attitude toward heavy plotting. Plot is, I think, the good writer's last resort and the dullard's first choice. The story which results from it is apt to feel artificial and forced. And that is such an on-the-nose description of the TV show, written over a decade before it was filmed, that I can't help but marvel. I don't share King's wholehearted aversion to plotting, but looking at the two versions of Under the Dome, I can't help but acknowledge that the man's got a point. To be clear, I'm not here to convince you that Under the Dome the novel is a particularly great work of literature or anything, nor that Under the Dome the TV show is particularly bad TV. Novel Big Jim is pretty much a cartoon villain after all. Terrorist one in the middle. A very clear antagonist, a bad guy to be pushed back against. Hell, he could be said to have brainwashed the town, though not through sci-fi wizardry, but rather through being a charismatic politician. You know, like a part of his character. And the show has some redeeming qualities, I'm sure. I just wanted to highlight how the novel's character-driven approach was its strongest asset and indeed appeal, and how the TV show, in trying a different storytelling approach, squandered the biggest asset of its source material until it became unrecognizable. Neither approach in and of itself is invalid, 
but the novel sure made better use of its approach. Thanks for sitting through my rambling about a Stephen King thing. Something something closing remarks be gay and do crimes.